welcome to the Chuck Shoe Podcast. Thanks for checking out my show. Vinny Dombrowski, the singer of Sponge, is my guest today. And I learned a lot about him and his career from my research and this interview. And I'm about to share that with all of you. And you're going to hear about Vinny's early path in the music business uh, from growing up in Detroit and starting out as the drummer to then forming Sponge and being the singer. And of course, his side projects, past and present, uh, the story behind some of their biggest songs, his relationship with Howard Stern, and a lot more. So check it out. I think you'll really enjoy this episode. Welcome to the show. I want to make sure I say your name right. Vinny Dombrowski. Is it Brosky? Dombrowski, yep. Okay. You're yeah. welcome. And I spelled it right, too. There's not a W in there. I saw some people spelling it with a W. That was wrong. That That's correct. Dombrowski, yeah. That, yeah. that means, uh, I'm not sure what it means. Is, or, is that, great, I think it means Dombrowski means great bowlers. Great is it Polish? Polish it's got to be Polish, right? <laughs> something like that, yeah. So you're born and raised in Detroit. Tell me about that. Like, did you actually live in the city or were you more like in the suburbs of Detroit or? No, I was um, born in, uh, in the city of Detroit, uh, grew up and managed to make it all the way through high school in the city of Detroit and continued to live and uh, raise a family in the city of Detroit wow. for many years. So, uh, you know, I'm outside the city now, but certainly uh, my family and I got quite a fill of the city prior to moving everybody out. Gotcha. And so at a young age, uh, was it Bob Seger? Was that the first musical thing that kind of changed your your uh, world there? Well, I, I think Seger definitely was a, a major force in that. My oldest sister, she would bring albums into the house. You know, mm -hmm. she kind of would educate all the other siblings on, on music. And one record was um, Bob Seger's, I think it was the Live Bullet record, okay. which was Seeger, you know, probably, you know, it was a chronicle of his life up and down the I-75 corridor. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. the players were, you know, big on Seeger. You know, I don't know if Bob, you know, was as big as we thought he was, because to us, Bob was like Bruce Springsteen. You know what I mean? Oh. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, the live bullet record was definitely where we got a big start. And then um, and yeah, he's from Detroit, right? Yeah, Bob is a Detroiter. Yeah. yeah, and then besides that, you had Elton John, the Beatles influence, Alice Cooper, Iggy Pop, the Sex Pistols, and then but David Bowie, that was a big one as well, right? That was the one that you idolized the most. Well, I, I think Bowie just kind of put it all together because, yeah, you mentioned mm -hmm. Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper and his band back in the day were certainly, you know, doing that kind of like androgynous thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that was typical of, of bands of that particular era. It was so shocking. And of course, Bowie, uh, probably around the Diamond Dogs era, we were certainly aware of his music prior to Diamond Dogs. But when Diamond Dogs came out, that was kind of post Ziggy Sard uh, Stardust. But there was something even grittier, more urban uh, in Bowie's music at that time. And it was probably because when I think about it, you know, the influence of Lou Reed, and Iggy Pop on Bowie. And that, you know, that influence existed around uh, Ziggy Stardust, but there was something that kind of hit deeper to the bone, I think, with um, um, Diamond Dogs. Mm -hmm. And so not only like the the sound, but the look too. I, th I, I see, I definitely see some of that influence in some of your outfits in the 90s, very like very shiny and stuff. And yeah, for sure. I mean, our second record kind of, you know, we dipped our toe into that a lot more. And, and of course, I think the, um, the fashion of the time being like the grunge fashion, yeah. uh, we, we certainly didn't portray ourselves that way, even from the first record, not like there was anything wrong with it, but I mean, mm -hmm. enough guys were wearing Doc Martin boots and, and right. playing with shirts, you know? Yeah. But so it's interesting. You actually started out before you were a singer, you were a drummer. Uh, and then I, this is interesting. I found that you were in a band at the age of 13, it was like a duo. It was kind of like a White Stripes, uh, Royal Blood thing before that was cool. It was just the two of you guys, right? The Kryptons or something like that? The Kryptons? <laughs> Man, you do your digging, bro. I, yeah. About that? <laughs> I found it on the internet. I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. You got to tell me about this band. Yeah, it was just uh, guitar and, uh, and and drums. And I can't, I can't recall um, anybody singing at the time. My buddy Lee 
my mm. next door neighbor, Lee Hugner, you know, he, we uh, managed to, you know, set up the guitar amps. We built our own cabinets and it was just a thrill to do something that was really, really loud. You know what I mean? Yeah. We got the drum set and the guitar rig that feeds back. And it was a lot of fun, man. You know, we would go out and play like, uh, uh, you know, local festivals if we could in Detroit on Six Mile and Gratiot or further on into the inner city at some local bars where they would let us play. What kind of music was it? Uh, it was kind of like prog rock or kind of math rock, you know? Okay. And I, I lean heavier on the rock side of it because, you know, I wasn't that smart. And to say math rock really kind of like uh, it suggests some kind of really like wild time signatures and stuff. But mm -hmm. it was just it was pretty raw, man. But it was instrumental for the most part. Mm -hmm. OK, gotcha. And then you did a band called uh, Warp Drive. But then later it was a uh, Loud House was kind of your first big band. Right. And you guys wrote your own songs and you got signed and you actually had a song. I didn't know this. You had a song on the Point Break soundtrack. There was actually a music video to the, I just watched this Smoke on the Water, a Deep Purple cover. It's yeah, kind of like man, a yeah. Red Hot Chili Peppers, Faith No More kind of thing, right? Yeah, it's weird because that particular song wasn't indicative of what was on the rest of the record. What I mean oh. is, you know, we, we got this uh, a crew of guys together to do a remix of what we had done. And that smoke on the water thing almost comes off. It would give people the impression that loud house was kind of like a nine inch nails band. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think loud house was more, you know, people equated it, unfortunately with Jane's addiction. Oh, I mean, I'm a big yeah. Jane fan. I'm a yeah. huge Jane's get me wrong, but there can't be two Jane's addictions. You know what I sure. mean? There's only one. Addiction. So yeah. um, I think people equated the band with a James Addiction ripoff. So it didn't last long. But the smoke on the water thing, you know, th yeah, we did that. George Clinton's in the video, which is kind of cool. George was a friend of ours and uh, mm. was nice enough to make an appearance in the video too. Uh, you know, through different channels. Our, our uh, production company at the time was owned by uh, a fellow by the name of Joel Martin, who went on to work with Eminem. Oh, and, wow. Uh, huge things in the music world so anyway yeah that, it was a cool point in time there was a lot of excitement and energy with the band at that point but that was like 1990 1991 something yeah like that. so what did you learn from that because it fell apart but you must have learned some things like you know how to get the song on the movie soundtrack and well you know the business part of it um i i mean i enjoy the business more so now but the business back then i wasn't so plugged into but one thing i certainly learned and we just spoke about it loud house seemed to have been perceived again as like a james addiction kind of copy band which mm -hmm. you know I, I thought it was unfortunate but the one thing i learned was moving on into sponge i think sponge could have really dug down heavy into the land of alice in chains and kind of been carbon copies of, of a band like that uh, we certainly had some material that could have moved us that way enough to make a whole record like that but i was dead set on what i had learned previous which was like you can't just sit and be perceived as a copy of another band you got to do your own thing so right. you know doing stuff like uh you know molly and rotting pinata um, I, I think helps steer us away from what people would have perceived as more of a typical grunge type band. Right. So that, yeah, in 1982, you form sponge and you move from drums to vocals. Um, I thought it was interesting that the, the original name was electric cattle gods and you guys were going to play a gig, gig and the name didn't fit on the marquee. So you just change it to sponge. So why not change it back later? Or you just decided at that point it was too late or. <laughs> We were just okay. We were just like perfect sponge. That's it. Um, it. There was no need to, you know, go backwards at that point. Although yeah. the electric cattle gods, man, I, you know, I look it up online. I don't. I don't even think there's a band called that right now. So I think it's a cool name. That is a cool name. Yeah. So who came up with the name Sponge? How was that the backup name? Uh, Chuck, I think that I think that name was on one or two lists of names, and finally, okay. you know you. you you weed it down yeah and somehow that just seemed like it worked for the for the night that we were playing and after that it just seemed like it worked so we were like leave it a sponge okay 
so cool. So you did a bunch of gigs kind of outside of town, Chicago and such. And then you decided that you were going to record the first album on your own dime. And so how did you guys afford that? Was that from the money from Loud House or like, cause recording was a lot more expensive back then, right? Now you can, everybody can do it in their basement, but back then it's like, that's pretty expensive, right? Well, it's, it certainly is, but you know, to put it into perspective, you know, when, when Loud House got signed, it's funny back then, it's like your manager made money, your lawyer, and you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not bagging on any managers or lawyers. No, but a lot of deals back then were front loaded deals, right? You know, fans back then, you had to make a publishing deal, you made a merch deal, you got your record deal. And man, a lot of money comes in, but a lot of money gets divided among a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So, what I netted, I think, in all of that with Loud House, I netted. And I got to tell you, I was living in a, a, a flat in Detroit, an upper flat for 140 bucks a month. And when you get $10,000, when you're a young guy like that, and that's all your rent is, you think you're rich. But <laughs> in no time after yeah. that band was done, I was right back cooking midnights in a restaurant. You know what I mean? Wow. So answer the question about, did we record it on our own dime, the sponge music? Absolutely. The big part about it, though, was... Um, the loft studio in uh, Saline, Michigan, which is outside of Ann Arbor. Um, our good buddy, Tim Padlin and his brother, Andy, and both of the fellas currently are in the band. Uh, we're so lucky to have the fellas uh, tour with us when we're out there on the road. Um, they had the studio, the loft out there. So it was kind of those, one of those things. Um, if we had a song, Tim would say, we'll just come out and record. As a matter of fact, that's how plowed uh, came to be. The song was written uh, on a Sunday afternoon real quick at my house. I called Tim up. He said, come on out to the studio that night and record it. And the version that's on the record is that version we recorded that that night. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's so, talk. What's that? I was just going to say, let's let's talk about that song, Plowed. I mean, that's Howard Stern's favorite song. It was actually the second single. There was another single before that. But um, you, you wrote the song in 10 minutes after Shovel and Snow in Detroit. So I'm always terrible at literary interpretation. And I guess Howard Stern's talked about, he's tried to find out the meeting. Has any, has anyone just asked you, I'm going to go ahead and ask you like, what, what is that song about? I mean, you know, I'm listening, looking at the lyrics. I'm buried by the sound in a world of human wreckage. I'm lost and I'm found. I can't touch the ground. I mean, I'm so bad at literary interpretation. Like, is it just kind of whatever you want it to mean? Or does it mean something specific to you? Well, I look at the the point in time of when that song was written and um, living in Detroit, experiencing life in the city of Detroit. Um, it, it The hits keep coming. And I don't mean song hits, but I'm mm-hmm. just talking about the setbacks in life. And whether it's my personal setbacks or setbacks within the city, you know, the city, you know, people always, I think, have heard about the riot in Detroit, 1967. You know, I lived on a corner, Houston, Whittier Dickerson in Detroit. At that time, I remember the Army National Guard rolling down the street to protect the citizens as best they could. The thing about it was, after that riot, most people that could leave that city left the city. My family and I didn't have the means to do that. We stayed. Mm. So the city basically slowly just burned. Um, for wow. 25 years before we left. So it's it, the, the, the neighborhoods were decimated. People's lives were destroyed. So when I think about the time of writing that song, um, I, I think about the, there might have been around the same time something called the St. Aubin Street Massacre happened. You know, just hearing about stuff like that, it really makes you cynical. And to say you're in a world of human wreckage, you are. But you try to rise above that environment. You know, you become... You either become a product of your environment or like the saying goes, you make your environment a product of you. And, you know, I'm lost and I'm found. I can't touch the ground because you got to stay above it, man. But a message that's a seed, you know, there's the seed of this new beginning, perhaps. And I think that is relevant in that song as well. But World of Human Wreckage, man, you know, Detroit living in that environment, it certainly was a world of human wreckage for us. Wow. And that's, it seems like it, it actually would fit with today's what's going on in the last year itself right here in America in 2020. In a, an enormous challenge on every level, a physical challenge, a, a mental challenge, 
a financial challenge. It's all of those challenges. And it really, it makes you, you know, these, these things that probably I'm throwing out more cliches, but it really, these struggles make you more of what you really are. It boils, mm-hmm. you, down, boils you down to your essence. And, you know, whether you're going to sink or swim in this situation, it really kind of judges your character, makes it, it really helps you understand more of what you're about. Mm-hmm. Now that's really cool. So it's like, like you said, rising above it because we're all going to face uh, hurdles for sure in life. I mean, all over, whether it's riots in, in Detroit or whatever, I mean, and so being able to rise above that and come out of that, I mean, you had the the issues with Loud House, that band didn't work out and that could have been the end, but you rose above that. And then, you know, you, perf- you uh, did sponge and on your own dime. That's pretty impressive. Well, we got that record before the label came in. Uh, we were more than halfway done recording right. the record. The label started to snoop around, and um, uh, a fellow by the name of David Kahn, who I think he was like head of A&R at Sony, he came out to the studio one day, you know, just to see what we were up to and look at the process. And uh, we did that. We finished that record unsupervised, although we did have A&R guidance from our buddy Pablo Matheson. Uh, he was always in our corner fighting with us all the time. Pablo came in and um, uh, A&R'd the record as well at that point. But, I mean, we were just recording songs and apparently doing a pretty good job of it. So, yeah, we just kept on pushing through. Yeah, and I love, um, no offense to Howard Stern, but I think Molly, that is my favorite song over the over Plowed even. That's my personal favorite. And I'm so stupid because I'm like thinking, what is this song about? And, of course, it's about Molly Ringwald and the movie Sixteen Candles, although I, I read that there was actually a deeper meaning um, that the the Cross Brothers had heard about some girl who fell in love with one of her teachers um, before her 16th birthday and then attempted to commit suicide. Is that right? That's that's more in the line of what this whole thing is, yeah. Yeah, he was just using the title as kind of a... Did you have to add the 16 Candles so people understood what the song... Because there's a lot of songs, like punk songs, where they, the, the title is something that doesn't have anything to do with the chorus or the verse. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's certainly to illustrate the 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 or cement the idea of like struggling adolescence for sure. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And um, you know, the, the Molly Ringwald connection. I mean, Molly Ringwald wanted to be in the video. Really? You know? Oh, that would have been so cool. Yeah, uh, we were stupid, man. We we were like, nah, it's going to be too cutesy, and, yeah. and it's going to take attention away from from the music but you know looking back i go that was a major mistake it might be cool to make another video of molly but include her this time sure sure so who did the yeah who did like the arrangement on that song because i mean i'm not a musician so i don't know i don't know the technical terms are but just the way the song is arranged with the backup vocals harmonizing and then the break where it's like 16 candles down the drain like who who did you guys do that together or was that one person kind of figuring out where all these things fit because it seems like a big puzzle the way it all fits it's like perfect in my opinion oh yeah man i mean you know a big part of the 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 song you know i start out with those the guitar arrangements and what i think was unique about sponge um from that particular era when guitar players worked together it was usually bands like the scorpions i love the scorpions yeah or judas priest you know i i mean and i i think judas priest is certainly one of the greatest rock bands to ever um exist so you would typically see two guitar players uh in, in the context of metal bands. However, um, bands of our background, um, you would see two guitar players, but not really utilizing arrangements, you mm. know, where, where guys are playing different guitar lines together. So Mike and Joey were very smart about, they would get together and um, mm. actually have writing sessions to, you know, figure out those guitar lines and make all those guitar things happen. So when you got the guitars plugged in to this song, you know, to the basic chords and melody and lyric, then it's, it's kind of a cool way to start putting in backup vocals and get the arrangements together. So all of those things were put together, like between rehearsal and the studio uh, out there with Tim Paddling. Oh yeah. It's, it's a brilliant. I love it. So, and then the band really starts taking off after this. You got uh, songs on the empire records and Mallrats and the craft soundtrack. And then I got to talk about this Lollapalooza. 
I never got to go to this, but you got to play with a, was it Metallica and Soundgarden? T- tell me about Lollapalooza. What do you remember from that? Well, believe it or not, I, I remember plenty. Um, you know, <laughs> That's later good. Later on, you know, after getting into the late 90s and early 2000s, then things got kind of foggy. But um, <laughs> that particular Lollapalooza was just, it was stunning. It was so diverse. Yeah. And, um, we were we were so fortunate to be on the, um, it was the second stage that we uh, performed on with um, uh, the Cows and uh, shit, man. It was uh, Buzz. How can I forget their name, man? The, the other, the, the, the seminal Seattle band. Oh, uh, the, the Buzzcocks? No, man. Buzz was a guitar player. I'm, I'm I'm actually having a brain fart right now, man. But I'll, I'll think about. Oh, uh, I, yeah, I'm from Seattle. I should know this. I, I'm I'm trying to blank. I know what you're talking. Not mud honey. Not. Uh, God, I'm trying oh. to blank. I might not know this actually. <laughs> uh, it's, it's right on the tip. It was guitar mind. player. Uh, was Buzz? Yeah, he's got the big hair. Uh, why am I drawing a blank? I'm gonna Google this here. Guitar player Buzz Seattle band maybe. It's Seattle, you said, right? Yeah, Seattle. Uh, Buzz Osborne, is that right? The Melvins, the Melvins. Melvins. That's uh, it. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I blanked on that. I feel bad about that because those guys were always very cool human beings. But uh, we yeah, were on the Cobain second- loved them too. I think, right? He was a big uh, oh, fan. Oh man, of I, I think a lot of bands loved the Melvins, man. Yeah. yeah. So, so we were on that second stage and. It was just so cool because we would play just a little bit earlier in the day. So we would get a chance to walk over to the main stage to see Soundgarden or see Metallica. And they'd have special guests showing up like Devo would do a couple dates. The Ramones would show up and do a couple dates. Um, Rage Against the Machine would show up, uh, from what I recall. But um, it was just wow. such an incredible lineup of bands, you know, and you yeah. just go, my God all right here and you can see this every day you're out there on the road man so it was like you know just a real special time for music and a special time for sponge for sure do you watch like on the side stage or do you go out in the crowd and hope people don't recognize you or you know what the guys in metallica were cool enough they let you stand in the wings to watch metallica a lot of bands don't do that man we've been throwing off a lot of stages yeah you know Bands get real picky about that sometimes, man. But Metallica was just like, nah, man, hang out. That's awesome. Man, what about, Metallica. yeah, Metallica. And then another legendary band, uh, two legendary bands you played with, uh, Kiss and Alice in Chains. Tell me about that because um, what it's like performing with Kiss. And then you said, I think you said this was Alice in Chains last show with Lane Staley. And you thought he was like doing fine. He seemed to be in good spirits and good health and everything. You know, I think they may have done one or two shows after that, but okay. uh, um, oddly enough, Stone Temple Pilots was supposed to be uh, the first band on that bill. So Stone Temple Pilots played first, Alice in Chains, and um, then Kiss. But uh, Scott was on his way into rehab. Oh. So they pulled off the bill, and we were coming back from I think we were overseas at the time and we were on our way back and our manager, Susan Silver called us up to ask us if we would fill in. And of course that's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. We're going, yeah, we'd like to fill in, but then we get a call from our agent and our agents like, um, so you guys think you're going to go play with Alice and chains and kiss, but there's this other tour going on in the UK. If you guys want to go back, it's this new emerging artist and she would open up for you. And I'm like, well, what's her name? And he goes, well, Alanis Morissette. And we're oh. like, ah, we never heard of her. <laughs> we're like, Whoops. We're going to go open up for Alice in Chains and hang out with the fellas. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's what we did. All right. That sounds, it was cool though. But, um, and then tell me, I had a question about this. So, cause Kiss is more of like a seventies band. You guys are kind of considered a nineties band, but you kind of wanted to get away from the eighties stuff. Did you ever cross paths with any of the eighties, like hair metal or heavy metal bands? Like, I mean, I'm a big Warrant fan. Um, or did you ever come across like a Warrant or a Poison in, in your years in the '90s like that? Like, and what was that? What was that like? 
Absolutely. Uh, not too long ago, we played with Warren. Oh. Uh, outside of Detroit, it was. Um, we opened up for them, as a matter of fact, in a, huh. a festival in Taylor, Michigan, and we um, we were asked by a uh, licensing company to do a remake of the Warren song "Cherry Pie." Oh, that's right! I heard that. That was kind of cool. And they wanted something like Nine Inch Nails meets Warrant or something like which which we did. Yeah, and I think it's out there on the internet someplace. But the fellas um, asked me to come and and sing it with them, and I'm like, dudes, somebody asked me to do this remake. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. I know the song. I just kind of recorded the tune. Right. You know, I think some we were big fans, but um, but it was cool to do that. I mean, we did probably one of the last gigs that Kevin Dubrow sang. Out in Bakersfield, California, we played a casino. It was Vince Neil, um, Quiet Riot, and Sponge. And right shortly, shortly after that, um, Kevin Dubrow unfortunately passed away. Yeah. Um, so w- over the years, we've done a number uh, of gigs with bands from that era. I mean, but just, not in the '90s, right? Was I mean, in the well, '90s, was there I, like a stigma against those bands? You know what? We we did nothing with those types of bands that I can recall in the '90s. Mm. Now, in in the last you know, 10 years we have. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, back then, nah, I think it was all about, you know, like, I mean, it, here's the funny thing too, from what we understood bands like Alice in Chains, when they were young and up and coming, they were out there playing with Van Halen. That's what I heard. So mm-hmm. I think there was some talk at one point of sponge going out to open up for Van Halen too, that would but fun. you know, it's something that never kind of transpired, but you know, music is music. And I think those fans and those bands you know, it, it seems to make sense somehow. I mean, for God's sakes, we were on the road with Neil Young and um, yeah. Patty Smith when he came out of, reti- out of her early retirement. Yeah. And you, you toured with Iggy Pop. So tell me about yeah. that because there were some issues. He, he wrote about your, your band in his book and I guess he was put off by the band or something. And like he wanted to switch. He was, you guys were opening for him and he wanted you to switch spots and he would open for you. Like, I think was he just, it was like maybe more people coming out to see you guys than he, than him. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. In um, the interview that Iggy did with Anthony Bourdain, I think it's in GQ magazine. He kind of explained it pretty good. You okay, know, I, I, I was I was pleased to see that. I mean, Iggy, I'll start with this. I got all the respect in the world for Iggy. I've always been a fan. I think he's a killer writer. You know, people go, oh, "You like Iggy's lyrics?" I go, "I absolutely love Iggy's lyrics." And um, as a performer, it, the thing is, like, Iggy kind of wrote the playbook on performance or physical performance. So back in the day, I mean, who wasn't diving off the stage and who wasn't, you know, like just diving off balconies and, and scaffolding and all. That? So come forward, you know, from back when he was doing that kind of thing into the mid 90s, I go of course we're out there doing that he wrote the playbook so i think Mm -hmm. he may have felt that there were more people coming to see us which i didn't understand that but yeah he wanted to swap spots yeah Um, he wanted to swap out uh spots on the bill but i mean you know that's a significant difference in money you know what i mean so it's like for us to close it we'd have to negotiate something um something different yeah but um you know I still think he was the proper headliner for that tour. And by the way, that was pre Stooges reunion stuff. You know, mm-hmm. when he got back together with the Stooges, that, in my opinion, was like a huge uptick in his um, uh, exposure. Oh. And his, um, his his career seemed to like just explode. His visibility was everywhere, man. But prior to that, man, you know, he was like he was out there like the rest of us just mm-hmm. slugging it out. Yeah. So in 2000, I think it was around the year 2000, uh, the Cross Brothers, they left the band. What what happened there? Like you've had some lineup change. I know you've had the same lineup for the last like 20 years or so, but why did some of the other uh, members of the band split? Did they want to do other projects or did they leave the music business entirely? Um, as far as I understand, um, uh, the Cross Brothers aren't involved in, in, in music like the, the, the touring Mm-hmm. Um, they, they may be writing or recording, but as far as like, you know, the band thing or being in a band that's out touring, I don't think they're involved in that anymore. Mm. So was it, you know, and, 
What's that? It was and it was th- was it their choice to to leave at that point, or did, was there like a falling out with you guys? Are you guys still on good terms, or what happened there? Well, I mean, it was weird. We did a um, a uh, event called the Detroit Music Awards about three years ago, and um, we got the old lineup back together for hmm. one performance. I think we may have done five songs, four or five tunes. I can't remember exactly, but um, Tim the Cross, the bass player. I hadn't seen him since he walked off the bus in Cleveland, probably in 1999. So, you know, it was nearly 20 years um, wow. since I saw him at rehearsal for the uh, Detroit Music Awards. And Mike, I've talked to on and off. Uh, but when Tim left the band, you know, I, I couldn't explain it to you. You know, obviously, mm. you know, frustrated uh, beyond explanation, I would guess. And, um, uh, obviously didn't feel being on the road in a band was worth it anymore. So he left the band. Okay. However, you know, I mean, everything seemed pretty cool at the rehearsals. Everybody seemed fairly, um, civil and they seem happy in their lives. And I go, that's pretty cool. Okay. Well, that's cool. Um, and then also in 2001, this is cool. I found this out. You got, you did a, a little super group here called spies for Darwin. I don't know how I never heard about this, but it's um, a couple Seattle people, Chris De- DeGarm- DeGarmo from uh, Queensright, uh, Sean Kinney and Mike Inez from Allison Chains. And you guys recorded an EP. The cool thing, I know musicians probably hate this, but now, you know, you can find everything on YouTube and Spotify. So I was able to listen to this. It's really good. Whatever happened with that, did you get, it kind of just fell apart or you did perform, I think, at Enfest in Seattle or something. Yeah, we did a, a performance at Enfest, uh, I think it was headline nickelback or something like that but yeah we did that but i think i think at that time though um alice was starting to get the idea in their heads that they're going to ramp up again you mm, know what i mean so yeah having the time to do anything else i think was kind of limited oh, okay gotcha it's interesting that they um they just knew you or something because you're not obviously in seattle so did you have to fly back to or how did you guys uh, rehearse and stuff i would fly out to seattle oh wow that's cool. Well, it's too yeah. bad that didn't, uh, uh, you know, there wasn't more work from that, but that EP is still available on Spotify and YouTube and stuff. And it's kind of cool to listen to. Um, and then you guys did, you obviously you did more records with sponge, um, from 99 to 2016. I think you had six more full length ab- albums plus live and compilations of, a, of that span. Like which one is your favorite? Um, cause that's one thing I hate about the music business. I feel like sometimes they, they just kind of stop playing bands, even if they make really good music. Is there one of those records or songs that you feel during that era has, was really, really good and should have been a hit. Wow. You know, I, I look at the, we put out an EP called destroy the boy. Uh, that was probably around 2010, I'm guessing. And then we put, we put together, a full length album and released it on a label called the end out of um, Brooklyn, New York. And that was about 2013. So that record became uh, a record called stop the bleeding. Okay. And off, you know, off of that particular record, I look at that, I go, you know, the song destroy the boy. I go, certainly could have been a uh, radio contender. We have uh, a song called um, uh, Coming from the Rain uh, that, I, that did get radio, hmm. uh, but, you know, never seemed to get a lot of traction at radio. Hmm. So um, I thought that record was a, a fine effort uh, from the band. Uh, but nonetheless, it's just, you know, there's not a lot of room at rock radio and having the finances to keep the pressure up uh, to maintain spins at radio, that's difficult as well. Yeah. And so do you, do you try to get the songs uh, licensed for commercials and movies and TV and stuff like that? Cause it seems like that's where a lot of the money is in recording these days. Yeah. I mean, you know, I used to do that plenty. Uh, I, I have a band called crud, right? Yeah. The, that, that particular style of music was very useful for a lot of like, uh, programmers at uh, tv and in movies and uh the thing is so few bands actually sell records anymore there's more money yeah. in licensing and that's where everybody started to go so sure. the, 
the, the licensing door was wide open at one point oh. and the licensing door just slowly closes, 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 closes. And it's so narrow right now for, for bands like mine uh, to license things. Uh, you know, that's okay. Cause I mean, we were on the road touring very steady yeah. and make, making a living doing that, but that door is kind of temporarily shut uh, for now. So yeah. like I was just ready to say one door closes, another door opens well, the door that opened closed. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Tell me about So you have the crud side project and then you have another side project. Are you still doing the, uh, what is it called? The Orbitsons? It's like a Johnny Cash country honky tonk band. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, the, the Orbitsons were always out there playing when I was home uh, from the road with sponge crud doesn't play too much. Although it, it's a fun band. It's a lot of fun to do the music. It's just, it takes more production and okay the country's going out to you know play in bars and, and have fun playing original songs like you know we write a lot of those orbits and songs you know hmm. it's a lot of fun to do and i get a kick out of that so um unfortunately we're not able to do that right now yeah I, did i hear that you were going to do a cover uh, ep or a record with sponge of cover songs yeah, you know what? We were talking about doing something like that. We wanted to call it Under the Influence. And okay. We did uh, a couple different tours a few years back, and uh, the promo was Under the Influence. So Sponge would basically, we'd play some of our songs, but we would play some of the songs that we were influenced by uh, coming up in the early days. So, you know, the Under the Influence thing, we could put together a whole album of like songs from bands that we really dig mm -hmm. from back in the day. Oh, that'd be cool. Well, so it might come out later then. Well, I'd love to do a record like that ASAP. We got the new Sponge record coming out. Oh, you do? Uh, it's recorded. It's been mastered and delivered to uh, a label called Cleopatra. Oh yeah, so I've heard that. Of that. Yeah, that's that'll be coming out. I would imagine by the spring because oh, very going, cool. with any luck, fingers crossed. Uh, there's a handle on this pandemic, and people are getting somewhat back to normal we can get out there and promote a new record oh that'd be very cool yeah so last year uh you got you guys got a little bit of a resurgence and you got to perform on howard stern's uh his new live music performance thing i get like i said earlier he's a big fan he mentions the band a lot and he told that he told the listeners that uh that the song he did plowed was a uh, inspiration when he was painting a portrait of his cat um and you guys you guys performed that uh plowed on his show and you also did a cover of uh, stp's vaseline is Howard, is he there when you're doing those live performances or do you just watch it later? We came in, uh, it was, I'm trying to think, was it a Monday? Howard was, to answer the question simply, Howard was not in the studio. Hmm. Um, we came in and taped uh, the segments. Yeah. And uh, we had been trying to get on the show. And I mean, like, We've got, we were contacted by his producer, Steve, several times. He's like, when are you guys going to be in the area? Well, we're always in that area on the weekends. You know, mm -hmm. we never sure. tour out right during the week. Right. So finally, uh, I said, we're going to make a special trip out. You tell me when we're supposed to be here and we'll come out. Yeah. And, he said, and we went out, we made the trip out. We picked up a gig along the way. I know it was. I think we were out there on a Thursday was what it was. And we picked up a gig on the on a friday and then we came back to detroit so uh yeah we made a special trip to record uh at the studios that that day that's really cool so does he do you ever hear personally from howard about that like hey good job guys or anything like that or is it just more like when he talks about you guys on air you know just when he talks about the group on air and it, it's what's so cool about it and what's so i guess it, the word touching i i just go when somebody is so inspired by music and it's, and it's an unsolicited response about something yeah that that's really that's really cool man you know what i what i heard about howard is that he grew up in a similar environment that i did that's you know, right yeah. it was very uh racially mixed neighborhood um he went to a school that was really racially mixed he didn't leave his neighborhood and i don't know i can't help but think there's some kind of connection there man because it's like you know that growing up that way it really cements itself in in, in a lot of the ways you think yeah did you, you 
Did you? I know he played your music a lot when he was at. Uh, I think was he at Detroit Radio in the nineties? I know he played it somewhere. Yeah. Did you ever? Did you guys ever go in and and do his show back then, or have you ever? No, interesting. Oh. No, we didn't. I mean, he's a big nineties music fan. Yeah, it's like he really like, you know, it's like any band that would go in to play his show, they would play a cover of some other nineties band, which I thought was a brilliant idea. Right. Uh, Goo Goo Dolls yeah. covered your song, Plowed. Yeah, go, that blew me away, man. <laughs> Johnny Goo, what a great guy. Yeah. So that's still flattering to hear stuff like when Howard Stern likes your song. That still blows you away. Even yep. it, you're not, You don't get tired of that ever. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's awesome, yeah. yeah. Yeah, why would I? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Very cool. Hey, so you got to tell me this story. I heard that you... Uh, <laughs> You know, just get, tell me some fun rock and roll stories. So you, there was a time that you were in Germany performing and you left on an airplane and you went back to the United States when you were on tour and your manager put you in rehab for 30 days after that. Tell me about the, what happened here with the story. Why did you just get on an airplane and head back to the United States? Well, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons <laughs> why I think. You know, certainly, uh, you know, being in a situation when you're in a rock and roll band, um, sometimes you're thinking the world is revolving around you. But at the same time, you're the leader and the focus point of a rock and roll band. And I'll, I'll tell you this much. Let's cut right to the chase. We're playing a show. We're on the road with Soundgarden out there. And uh, those folks, those people in the audience, they don't have access to radio from the United States. You know, they don't know Plow. They don't know Molly. You know, mm. so we're up there playing our half hour set or whatever it was. And people are just not reacting. They're just like, you know, they're, they're ready to see the headliner band, you know. So I'm like, you know what? We're going to play something that they know. We're going to play Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd, because hmm. we would do it from time to time, right? So, okay. Uh, we, we played that song. We finished our set. However, our manager, we had a separate manager for um, Europe. She was furious with me because she bought she brought out, like, lots of promoters. And back then, if you were doing a cover song, like, you were looked at like a cover band. Hmm. and. I, I didn't necessarily see it like that back then, but that's how people looked at it, that you were a cover band and it's kind of belittling to what you're trying to do. And she basically said to me, she was so mad at me. She goes, Vinny, I can't believe you did that. She had a lot set up and she probably has some press out there too. And she said, you might as well just go home. So oh. <laughs> I'm out there living the rock and roll life. I'm, you know, up partying for like three days straight. And you know what? I'm going, I could use a break, you know? So I go, okay, perfect. And I'm going to go to the airport, hop on a plane and come back to Detroit, man. You know, where I made it to New York. I mean, I literally went to the airport in Germany and I said, get me a ticket back to the United States. Like what city? I go, I don't care what city, just whatever plane's leaving first and happen to be going to New York. So I made it to New York and took a bus from New York to Detroit, you know? Wow. And, um, not, you know what? And certainly not a smart thing to do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certain that in many ways I've paid for that and I continue to pay for that to this day. <laughs> you know, it's and it, certainly sometimes people go out. Oh, it's a funny rock story. And um, but, you know, in the name of rock and roll, it's kind of cool. I don't know. I still can't assess anything cool in that. Cause I think it, you know, I know I disappointed a lot of people. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm certainly heartfelt sorry for that, you know, and, um, well, we've all done stupid shit in our twenties. I mean, that's, if that's the worst thing you did, that's not so bad. So well, that's I, I feel not like... the worst thing I've done. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I plead a fifth, man. A fifth. Okay. All right. Fair enough. You don't get any other, uh, wor <laughs> you want to tell me what the worst thing is. I plead a fifth. Plead the fifth. All right, fair enough. Well, so you haven't stopped. Even you went to thirty days in rehab. Your manager made you do that, but you haven't stopped partying. You still like to have a good time. I always, I'm always fascinated by this because I talk to so many rock stars, and so many of them are like, "I don't drink anymore. I've totally cut out." 
alcohol. And then other ones, like I had Rachel Bolin on here the other day. He's like, yeah, we still do shots when we, before we go on stage. So I'm always fascinated by this. Do you have to slow things down a little as you get older or? How old are you? 42. I have to slow I'm, things down a lot. <laughs> well, man, in the 40s, you know what? What I noticed about the 40s is you can't eat like you could eat. Yes. In in your 30s like that all of a too your body, yeah. meta- your body metabolism changes now you know in my mid 50s that's when like i go something's going on like I, I literally i can't operate and drink the way you know i i used to which is mm-hmm. a quick bounce back and nobody likes to drink too much that's for sure but i admire the fact that a lot of these folks don't party anymore because as you get older you really can't party like you used to anyway if you just pay for it you keep paying for it yeah you keep paying for it so i'm just like man i'm i i I really i i pulled way back man i shouldn't be drinking i spent five years not drinking and there's only one way happened there was only one way that happened one going to meetings the other way keep going to meetings but when you when sponge plays and has played bars if you're in a bar every night every night and you can't get to meetings you know what guess what you're going to start drinking again so Mm. you know i spent five years without it and um sometimes i think i'm better i would be better served if i didn't drink at all but i spend my life it seems in a bar Mm. you know Hmm. spend all your time in a bar what are you going to do a lot of these guys that don't drink anymore they have systems set up man Mm. basically if they're on tour you know it's nowhere backstage you're not going to find a beer backstage and that's what you need you maintain your sobriety by not having and this is odd because if there's a guy that drinks telling telling (laughs) anyone what worked for me was yeah you know going to meetings and staying away from this shit but i mean we spent all our time in bars man so it's just like i don't i don't i don't know how to stay away from it necessarily and like most of us there's no moderation but you hope you find some moderation someplace well you had a rule clear liquor on show days brown liquor on off days wasn't that one of the rules that you had you set up some rules and things like that (laughs) yeah i think i was talking to whitey morgan man Hmm. one day about this i I don't know why he remembers but it's just like we're talking about you know whiskey and shows and 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 i i I said, I can't do whiskey on show days. It affects my stomach or something, you know? Mm. So yeah, clear liquor does not do that. Hmm. Clear liquor does not affect your stomach the way brown liquor does for some reason. What about I, 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 me? Yeah. What about, uh, I don't know if weed is legal in Michigan. They just legalized it here in Arizona. Is uh, Do you ever do the legal weed? You ever tried that, the edibles or any of that kind of stuff? No, I was always doing it when it was illegal. <laughs> and um, I don't smoke weed. Yeah. You know, I just, I haven't for years, you know? Because, I mean, when you're doing drugs, anything goes, but, you know, I don't do that shit anymore. Drinking is, is bad enough. <laughs> yeah. Are you still doing the jumping rope to say, cause you're still pretty physically fit. So I, I've uh, my knees are shot, man. My shit. knees, I can't do that. I can't skip. I mean, I work out all the time. You know, I got a heavy bag in the garage. Okay. I got, I got a slip bag, man. So I can get my Mike Tyson, uh, peekaboo boxing style nailed down so i i i I work out every day man but that's good skip and roll man my knees Uh, are shot yeah for sure well you had an interesting point you said about being in a rock band and touring it's like people don't realize the price that you pay for some of this like that you said like you've missed a lot of birthdays and anniversaries and things like that like the the price for success that people don't see talk about that like the price for uh, all this hard work that you've put into the band well that hard work is what we call building the road and building the road for sponge to travel on even today it it takes enormous focus and enormous sacrifice and it takes a toll on your personal life it takes a toll on your health it takes a toll on you spiritually it takes a toll on everything but i suppose if you're that focused and that driven anything could possibly be detrimental to you so that that Mm. the sacrifice Mm. that the music business requires of anybody and and let's face it sometimes there is no success at the end of the road, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just go on and 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 you do what you do because that's what you are. And there's no hmm. apologizing for it. That's what you do. So I go, you know what? Nothing's going to change with me. I'm going to keep doing this to the day I die. And um, 
that, that's a that's really it. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm going. I got nothing else I could do. I really en- I still enjoy doing this. I still enjoy getting up on a stage. I still enjoy writing songs because primarily that's what I look at myself as. I'm a guy that writes songs. It happens to be in a band, so. I, I really enjoy writing songs. So writing songs and singing songs, man, I really get a kick out of that. And I get a kick out of my friends that write songs and, and, um, well, you and know, you're, I just, yeah, you're really good it. at it too. You have the, obviously you have the talent. I think you, you know, would, if you hadn't had a hit at this point, I might tell you to give it up, but I mean, I think you're doing pretty good, right? Oh, uh, you know, I've been so fortunate, you know, we worked on the sponge record that's wrapped up, you know, my connection to you, uh, today was uh drew fortier yeah uh, and you know w- we finished uh writing and recording a record with uh dave ellison and um and mike heller so i mean this and this band just sounds fantastic but i found myself in a situation where i was home not touring and lo and behold um the fellas sent me like 30 demos man <laughs> and let me go through all these demos wow and we ended up I think demoing out about 13 songs and tracking officially nine. So, and this record is hell on wheels, man. It sounds killer. What is this band called? I, I, I was, wasn't supposed to bring it up unless you brought it up, but you brought it up. So now I can ask about it. It's called lucid L U C I D. Okay. And when do you think this will be out? You know, it's really the same answer. Um, there's a fella by the name of Lassie Lammertz. Uh, I think he's out of Germany. That's uh, he's mixing the record. He's got everything. I literally cut my last vocal last week. Okay. And uh, you know, I, I think I'm not sure when it's going to be released. I, I think it might, uh, the record may find a home at a label and then who knows, hmm. but you know, I'm, I'm the kind of guy I, I, I love to work. I love the process. Yeah. So the out just go it's out of my hands now you know i go i don't know what the hell is going to happen i never knew what was going to happen back in the sponge <laughs> days i go all i know is i'm going to work yeah and then out of my hands okay very cool hey i wanted to get your thoughts on uh censorship because i remember like when i grew up a kid in the 80s and there was like remember they're trying to do those uh stickers the parental advisory stickers on the records and stuff in the 80s and then you know there was kind of this like fight with that and then I guess they they settled on okay you could put the sticker on but you know you can still buy the record. It seems like I haven't really heard a lot about censorship in a, in a long time. It seems like that's kind of coming back on social media and the internet. I'm just curious like your thoughts on on that. Are you are you for some of this censorship or are you against all censorship or what is your thoughts on that and like especially with music? Back in the 80s the most the most threatening thing was something perhaps on a rock and roll record. Yeah. yeah. And that was something that if it had that sticker on it, everybody understood that it was something potentially for young years, not mm-hmm. good. Right. Um, but these days, I, I got to tell you, uh, Chuck, I'm not aware of any kind of censorship campaign, especially given what the content is on YouTube. I go, you know, I know they idle it down for people that they go, well, it's, they're they're too young. But even what's on there, and I guess okay for young people to view, I go, is still like far beyond what we were exposed to as young people. Do mm-hmm. I think there needs to be some kind of, uh, you know, they put they really put it in the hands of the parents, unfortunately. You know what I mean? They put yeah. it on our shoulders to go, you got to keep an eye on your kid. Well, Good luck. My parents <laughs> could keep an eye on me when I was a kid if they tried. Yeah. You know what I mean shit. You know, we're out smoking weed and drinking. We're 15 <laughs> years old, you know, keeping it up. Right. And, you know, they couldn't keep an eye on me. So it's a, I'm like, we could, parents, any parent, I think, could use some help in that. You know, I, I don't think, look, I love playing bars. I love playing bars that are. You know, you can't look scared when you go into the Orbitsons. My other band would play those kind of places. So for me to sing songs with a lot of vulgar words and the night being that way, I go, I'm in a bar with a bunch of adults. Mm-hmm. You know, Lenny Bruce, God bless you. Let's let's go. Yeah. So but when it's like, you know, some kid sitting on his iPad at home and, you know, I go, he doesn't need to hear that shit. Right. You know, in a bar. I'm not some self-righteous asshole, but in a bar to me, anything goes. I, okay. Anything, Fair enough. You know? Yeah. But outside of that, man, I go it, it really something I'd like to see something done 
but I think it makes me look like, you know, I'm some kind of prude, you know, but <laughs> I, I could use the help yeah. as a parent. No, that's interesting. And also, like, you don't have social media, do you? I couldn't find you on Instagram or uh, Facebook. Oh, me? Yeah. Do you? Oh, yeah. You don't, yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah, do. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm active with the uh, sponge um Facebook and the Instagram. You, you're talking about me personally? Yeah, like you don't have your own account. You don't have a, an Instagram account or do you have a Twitter or any of those things? Or No, I mean, I, I just basically do a lot of my stuff through the sponge. Okay. Uh, Facebook. So it's uh, Facebook forward slash sponge rocks mm. and sponge has an Instagram account. So, you know, I'm, I'm usually on the sponge account uh, throughout the week or on the weekend, something okay. like that. Cool. Um, well, thanks so much for doing this interview. I'd like to end with a charity. Is there one that you work with or you want to give a shout out to? Oh, man, I saw that. I, I, I appreciate that. We do. And we've done this for the past. Uh, this would have been the third year. The night before Thanksgiving, we work with a, a homeless shelter uh, in downtown Detroit. It's called hmm. the Pope Francis Center. People go, Pope Francis, it's got to be Catholic. What do they need the money for? Uh, they are completely privately funded homeless shelter in downtown Detroit. The Pope Francis Center, you go to PopeFrancis.org, PopeFrancisCenter.org, I think it is. Okay, and, I'll find um, it. I'll put it in the notes. They they do a fantastic job feeding the homeless community, offering showers, legal advice. They also give uh, homeless folks that don't even have an address Basically, you got like a mailbox. You got an address. So if you're looking to help your life out, get a job. Oh. Pope Francis Center gives you an address as well. My buddy, Chris Harthen, he's a director down there and uh, does a fantastic job. Unfortunately, this year, Sponge can't do the big benefit that we do um, for the Pope Francis Center. Yeah. But we put out a record, a record that's going to be available um, just before Christmas of uh, Detroit bands doing Detroit songs called Songs That Got Me Through It. So oh. the Pope Francis Center. Folks, that's the charity that uh, sponges work closely with. Okay, well, that's awesome. Very cool. And then people should keep an eye out for all these projects that you have coming up. Anything else you want to give a shout out to? Or I, I love what you do, Chuck. I appreciate Thank you. your time. Thank I, you. I really do. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, you too. All right, thanks. Take care of yourself. All right, you too. Bye-bye. So Vinny Dombrowski, singer of Sponge, check out their catalog and all the side projects. They're available on Spotify and YouTube. Check out the website and the merch store. They got some cool stuff over there. Follow the band on Facebook and Instagram to keep up with the new releases and the tour dates when those happen again. Uh, follow me on social media and subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss an episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can share it on your social media or write a review on iTunes. I'd sure appreciate that. That would help me out a lot. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, shoot for the moon.